Good evening and hello, Southwest Montana and, and friends and family around the country. Uh, welcome to the Big Sky Virtual Town Hall and uh, official welcome to winter 2020, 2021. I'm excited at the ski area getting ready to open this week. So welcome to winter. I am Eric Ladd and tonight I am joined by one of my fellow outlaws, Joe O'Connor, to host an incredible panel and vibrant discussion around important community topics. So nine years ago, nine years, nine months, it feels like nine years, nine months ago, <laughs> we, uh, we found ourselves in this COVID pandemic. And uh, through the urging of a lot of you fellow neighbors and community members, we decided to start this, this uh, virtual town hall platform and nine months later, we find ourselves still doing it and finding it relative to the community. So we're grateful to have you here. Tonight, our panel consists of great minds to talk about everything from frontline efforts as it relates to COVID and testing to local efforts to get our community open for the winter season, mental health and all the important topics surrounding this and initiatives that the community is starting to see launched here and global perspectives on business and growth and the great migration West. As always, I'm grateful for the sponsors who help underwrite the town hall and help support our team to make this panel happen. Companies and groups like the Chamber of Commerce of Big Sky, Resort Tax and LNK Real Estate have been gracious in helping underwrite many of these town halls and we are appreciative. First, I'd like to find it, at first I'd like to open with a quote from today's New York Times that ran a headline story about Southwest Montana Bozeman and Big Sky. I found the timing of this article ironic and that many of the topics that we're gonna cover in tonight's story were touched on this story that went viral and around the world today. So for those that haven't seen it, the headline was pandemic crowds bring River Geddon to Montana rivers. As urbanites flock to forests and rivers to escape the coronavirus threats, trailheads are cramped with, with parked cars and fishing on the Madison River is like a Disneyland ride. The story goes on to say the phenomenon of gridlock in this natural paradise has been seen across the West for years, but in Montana, it accelerated markedly this year, fueled by urbanites fleeing the pandemic. Now many residents are concerned that the state that calls itself the last best place has bragged a little too loudly and a little too often. Those are two small excerpts from this great story and I definitely would encourage you to read it all. We'll make sure we link to it on Explore Big Sky Facebook page. The past nine months have been a wild ride and, and trying time to be alive and witness what has happened in Southwest Montana. Who would have thought looking back since March that we would be talking about the largest real estate boom in the history of Montana, double digit growth in our region, robust tourism this summer despite COVID and nationwide recognition and discussion of our region. We are grateful to have the means and the leadership in our community to have made good inroads to keeping things rolling. And while it appears COVID is still dominating the headlines, we have new topics like growth, conservation, mental health, and sustainability that are rising to the headline category. So let's dive into it and get started. Tonight's panel to help with this discussion, we have Danny Birchwald, the executive director of the Resort Area Tax District. He was also just named to a governor's committee to help address the COVID and testing pandemic, ongoing pandemic. We have Laura Sobolski, the director of missions from Charlie Health, Gary Rochelle, founding managed partner of Queeming Venture partners and also longtime local of Big Sky, and Dr. Eric Lowe, the ER physician of Bozeman Health. Our format's going to be a little different tonight than what we've done in the past. We're going to try to bounce around to a number of the different panelists to kind of get a vibrant discussion going. If you're watching tonight and would like to submit a question, throw it in the comment feed on either Zoom or Facebook and we'll do our best to get to them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off with a question for each of you and I'd like you to go around and be able to answer it for us and then we'll dive in. And I'm going to start with Danny, and the same question goes for everybody, is what's something that's either waking you up at night or keeping you up at night, and it can't be that bad pizza that you ate? So Danny, what's something that's waking you up at night or keeping you up? <laughs> bad pizza could certainly be one of the things that would be waking me up in the middle of the night. Um, you know, my dad is a, a chaplain over in the Billings Clinic, and if you watch the rising cases and what's happening over in Yellowstone County, that's certainly of concern as we're sitting here on this call. I have a friend that just texted me <clears throat> who uh, was admitted into the ER and uh, diagnosed positive with, with coronavirus as well as pneumonia. And he just gave me the thumbs up that he, he got back home. Um, very interested in, in moving forward to support the governor elect on this, this task force and 
the things that are keeping me up at night is how do we get through this winter season here in a economy in Big Sky that relies very significantly on our, our skiing uh, capabilities. And I'm looking forward to hopefully bringing that perspective to the table at a statewide level. And um, yeah, glad my buddy's out of the hospital. Not gonna be kept up as much tonight. Yeah. Well, if he's watching, uh, thumbs up to him and wishing him well. Uh, Laura, how about yourself? What's keeping you up at night or waking you up? And I think it's important to talk about some of the stats that are surrounding COVID and, and Charlie helps just being, you know, boots on the ground. We're finding that, you know, half of middle school and high school students are concerned about their mental health, especially during the pandemic. Um, and that one in three of those high school and middle school students have experienced some kind of depression um, during the pandemic. Um, and that 93% of those students don't have proper access to mental health care. So that is alarming and keeps me up at night. Excellent. Well, we'll take a minute to dive, a couple minutes to dive into that a little bit more, but thank you for that. Uh, Gary, how about yourself? What's something that woke you up recently? Well, it's, it's somewhat along the lines of what Daniel and Daniel and Laura were saying. I mean, you have your own personal friends that are dealing with this and they can be dealing with it because of the disease or they can be dealing with it because they're a healthcare worker or they're dealing with it because they're depressed. I mean, it's, it's a really wide range of this. This has pretty much impacted every part of society and and uh, I guess I worry if I was, if I was going to worry about one thing or one thing that I, because I don't see the outcome yet, is how we're going to afford to pay for what it costs to actually recover from this. Right. And I think that the small business recovery process will be painful and long. The cost of the healthcare system is going to be painful and long. Um, we're just not really set up yet because we don't have a good handle yet on what the real costs have been whether it's Big Sky, Bozeman, Montana, or the United States in general, we don't have a good handle on that. So I think until we start to get real numbers around what that takes, I think that's always going to be a, a major concern. Excellent. Well, that's, that's good. And I'd love to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, Dr. Lowe, how about yourself? I think I would echo a lot of what each of the others have already said. Um, and as Laura hit on with the kids, I worry about my own kids and, and their experiences through the year with this. Um, but probably to, to pick one thing in particular, I worry about the, the toll that this is all taking on our healthcare workers. Um, I work as a ER physician and as the director for the ED in Bozeman. And, um, I feel like we've got a, a whole system from the housekeepers through the nurses, through the physicians who have been running a marathon for nine months of change and new processes and uncertainty and fear. And now it's getting bad um, nine, 10 months in and there's not a clear end in sight. Uh, so I worry about the toll that's taken on everyone and how to keep, keep that going. And then the recovery from that, both mental and emotional and financial and all the other aspects. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that. And, and hopefully we say it many times tonight, many thanks to your, you and your team for all the great work. And it's, it's hard to imagine that nine months into it, now it's just getting worse. And so once again, our hats off to them. I'm going to put him on the spot because this guy works hard and he's in the field every day. Joe, how about yourself? Our managing editor of all of our publications. What's something that's keeping you up at night? Yeah. Um, Thanks for that, Eric. I would say something that's keeping me up right now is, um, you know, part of it is it's, it, you know, we report on this every day. I wouldn't say we are by any means in a situation where Dr. Lowe is with his boots on the ground um, front line, but, you know, learning what we learn and reporting what we learn uh, to our readership, um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to read. It's difficult to understand really what's going on. And I think ultimately what keeps me up is, is um, mixed messaging and, and what that means for our families. I mean, we all get in these Zoom calls. We have phone calls with our families from all over the country, you know, all over the world in some cases, and, uh, and really trying to get on the same page with everyone. It's a confusing time. Very much so. Well, I'm grateful for you and your team's work. So, so let's jump into it a little bit more. Um, I'd like to start with Gary. And Gary, 
was on our first panel back in March and has also been a, an amazing community leader, very philanthropic and supporting a lot of good, great causes around the area. And he's also been a mentor to me. So when this all hit and I was trying to figure out what the heck was gonna happen and who to pivot and how to pivot, um, Gary was one of the first phone calls I made and he actually helped come up with this idea of us doing this town hall. So I'm grateful for that. And so he was on our first town hall. So nine months later, we invited him back and we thought it'd be fun to do a little bit of a look back because Gary did some amazing predictions and that, that recording still exists on our Facebook page. I'd encourage you all to go back and look at it because scary. good or bad, Gary, a lot of your predictions came true. So we will never doubt you again. So uh, how is it looking back for me in nine months, Gary? Well, I think that I, I always am a little fretful when someone starts to remember things I said six or nine months before. Um, and, uh, but I think on the COVID, on the crisis and how it's evolved, um, I would say right now you start to become a little more optimistic perhaps than I would have been back then. I'm very surprised that you have three vaccines that are above 90% efficacy that are all now either going in for urgent approval or uh, will be in the market relatively soon. Because what that means is you're gonna be able to have, by the springtime, you'll have hundreds of millions of people that will have received that vaccine. And then you can start to make the case that you really, that everyone probably should receive the vaccine. That's gonna be one of the real tension points next year. Um, Qantas Airlines announced today that when the vaccines are readily available, you don't have a vaccine, you don't get to fly. So I think you're going to start seeing private enterprises insisting that if you if you're going to want to come in this building or if you're going to want to work in this company or if you want to travel, you're going to have to demonstrate that you have a vaccine. And we haven't we haven't seen anything as adults. We do that to our kids, but we haven't seen that as anything like that as adults. But the the speed of the vaccines coming out, the efficacy numbers are really quite remarkable. Um, in the early days, the, the conventional wisdom was you'd be lucky to get to the same level as the flu which is 50%. And 50% would have been, so that would have been a met expectations back in the August, September timeframe. But now these whisper numbers all above 90%, and whether it's the Chinese vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Moderna, you're seeing relatively consistent numbers that are much higher than that. And that's extremely reassuring. Um, we still don't know, is this a yearly vaccine? You have to the two shot version, the single shot version, but is it something you'll have to have every year? You know, what's going to be, because we, we, there just hasn't been the time to do the 12 month post-vaccination post trials. But I would expect at this point to be pretty positive. And if it was simply a matter of getting a vaccine every year, but it was 90 plus percent effective, that would be a huge, uh, a huge win. Yeah. Um, the other thing that's come out is, and Steve Daines had a lot to do with this, um, getting the pharmaceutical companies to work together to share manufacturing capacity. So you will be able to have literally a billion vaccines in the market by April. And so that is something that, again, sitting back in March of this year, you would not have forecast that. So by this time next year, you should have literally have had billions of vaccine, vaccinations occur, which is also quite extraordinary. And that required the government to cooperate, but it really required some of the restrictions on companies cooperating to be lifted. Um, we also got lucky because a lot of these new vaccines have an RNA. Now, I, I'll stay away from the jargon, too much of the jargon, but they have a different base for a vaccine than was used before. And that happened to be maturing right around the time that this could be used. So Moderna is a good example. A year earlier, Moderna would not have had the platform ready to create their COVID vaccine. So literally the science had arrived at around the time where you could start using it. Uh, this new platform. So that was also quite, uh, you know, quite extraordinary. So I think I would start to look at this as we talked, I think back then, it would be March and April before there'd be large numbers of people being vaccinated globally. I think that that's probably true. Um, but I would, I would definitely have undershot the efficacy numbers. And I would have undershot the, the expectation now in terms of the number of people that will be vaccinated. Um, the real issue is going to be, are we going to have the discipline to, because some companies, some entities will absolutely force people to do that. Um, how we deal with the uh, feeling about vaccines, still 40% of the people surveyed today would say they're not going to take a vaccine. That's not going to get us to where we need to be with this. Yeah. 
Hey, Joe here, mind if I jump in? You know, you talked about the distribution um, of these vaccines and, you know, I was curious, you know, I've been reading quite a bit about the storage um, component and they need to be kept at um, at least one of them in an extremely cold uh, freezer. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little about that and what, what that means for um, storage and distribution of, of these vaccines. Well, Montana, it's great. You can just leave it outside for most of January or February. It's not going to be a problem. But um, no, so Pfizer's, Pfizer's vaccine, they're saying minus 70 Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So that clearly requires highly specialized story. I don't know storage. I don't know the Moderna numbers. Some of the other vaccines that are coming out that have lower efficacy, but they're also based on more traditional platforms, will not have those kind of extreme storage requirements. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a mix. You know, clearly, if, if the global vaccine has to be stored at minus 70, we're going to be in trouble. Right. You know, that's simply not going to be available to, you know, 90 percent of the world's uh, world's population. Um, I think the system, if, if you want to actually, Eric, going back to your first question, what do I worry about? The fact that this transition is occurring the way it is between a Trump and Biden administration really bothers me because this this crisis and the distribution of these drugs is absolutely something that should be seamless between the two administrations. And it's not going to be simply because the uh, recalcitrance in terms of the Trump administration. This is one that should have gotten above politics. This is one that should have stepped above that. And I'm actually quite disappointed that we're having that conversation. Uh, we're still having that conversation because distributing these vaccines is not going to be easy. You're going to have to decide it'll be done through the states so the federal government won't have much to the vaccines that get to montana the federal government will probably have very little to say about what happens with the vaccines that are in montana and how montana chooses to administrate that so again you're going to have a really wide variance 50 states 500 municipalities you have really wide variance in terms of how that system is going to work and that's going to be frustrating for a lot of people no, that'd be very frustrating. Um, you know, another thing looking back, Gary, is, is, you know, one of the questions I asked you back in March was your advice to small business owners and some of the predicted, you know, things that were going to happen because of COVID happening. And I'd be curious on your, you know, look back there, you know, looking back, but I think one of the big byproducts that came out of COVID was this massive boom in real estate. I mean, Myself, you know, I'm a part owner of a real estate company. We never would have predicted that we were going to see nearly 35% appreciation in real estate since March. So I, I don't know. I mean, I'd be interested on your thoughts there and kind of how you see that moving forward. So the one thing, the things that it definitely have, um, have panned out or occurred the way that I expected. So working from home absolutely uh, became a real thing. And back then, Microsoft was saying, you don't have to go back to work till the end of the year. Now it's, you don't have to go back to work, period. You're going to be, you're going to be able to work from home. Amazon just told several thousand executives today, you, don't, you need to be able to come to Seattle, but you don't need to live in Seattle. So these are, these are fundamental changes, and these are high-level jobs. And unfortunately, so the whole work from home phenomenon, now we're just getting our hands around you know, you see Lowe's, Home Depot, total boom year because everyone wants to make their home now the place. You're going to have to educate your kids from home. You're going to have to work from home. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to find your comfort at home. This is, good. this is a big deal. So that's not going to change. It's going to stay that way for quite some time. Um, the online education, um, the big challenge for society will still be Will we use this as an opportunity to fix our K through 12 education system? Because I got in trouble. I might as well get in trouble on this call too. But to me, when you look at the point I made in another Zoom call was it's really when you look at what is systemic racism, systemic racism is having your zip code determine the quality of your education. That's systemic racism. And now with online education, we need to rethink, shouldn't the best teachers in districts be the ones giving this, the, uh, this, the uh, uh, teaching the class, the teaching the initial concepts, the rest of the teachers are filling in and supporting. There's a whole different way to think about education if this technology becomes under, starts to underpin that. So I think we saw online education as something that we weren't sure what direction it's gonna go. 
And it's going to be up to us as a society to choose, you know, how far and what, and what direction that goes. And then online healthcare. Um, I had just had a very frustrating experience because I called my cardiologist and I wanted to have a Zoom call. Well, it turns out the government did the right thing and they said Zoom calls are now official appointments so people, could, the doctors could get reimbursed for them. Ah, but what that meant was that my cardiologist in Seattle, who's not licensed to practice in Montana, couldn't do the Zoom call with me when I was in Montana. So again, every time you pull on one of these threads, you find one or two more things that you need to fix in the whole system. So we're still early in the process of what we have to do to just, and, and if we're open-minded, if you approach this with an original mind, I think we can make a lot of progress on this, but it's, we're, we're, we're in the thick of it for a while. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll come back to you in a second, Gary. We'll, I'm gonna get some more predictions from you for nine months from now, but I'm gonna jump over here to Laura. Um, happy to have her join us tonight. She's with a group that's new to our platform called Charlie Health and also kind of new to the region. Um, Laura, can you give us a little intro about what you guys are up to here and, and your focus on mental health has obviously become a really important discussion point in our community and in the news um, lately. So I'd love if you give the, the community a little bit of introduction to yourself and what you guys are up to and some of the important threads that you guys are following right now. Yeah, sure. And I think that, you know, based off of what Gary just said, it's all very applicable to mental health and behavioral health. Um, you know, I love Montana. Um, our co-founders of Charlie Health love Montana. We have deep roots here, but Montana is struggling um, based off of, you know, the statistic I mentioned earlier about how grand the rural population is here, yet 93% of those human beings don't have access to proper behavioral health care is a major issue. And uh, the collective trauma that COVID-19, you know, between social isolation, increased screen use, it's really just exacerbated underlying issues, depression, not only in our youth, but, you know, young adults and adults and seniors. So, Something that our mission is, it is our mission, it's access for all. It's how do we get the, this virtual mental health, substance abuse, behavioral health care into the hands of everybody in this state. Um, and, you know, and we're finding our own barriers, our own red tape that we have to work out. Um, but, you know, we're hell bent on this mission. Um, COVID has assisted us in getting there um, with, you know, getting in network with insurance providers and whatnot. And in the past, we were denied. Um, so we're hoping that this trend keeps moving forward. Um, you know, most of our clients right now are in the most rural parts of this state, and they're able to have, you know, prime clinicians treating them regularly at a higher level. Um, so when we think about statistics and how COVID has impacted them and it's driving up suicidality um, and attempts and depression and anxiety, um, you know, we, we need to counteract that with getting virtual mental health care into the hands of these people. And that's exactly what Charlie Health is doing through an intensive uh, outpatient program that will forever be virtual. Um, so that's really what we're on a mission to do is just educating Montanans that we are here to support them. We want to collaborate with hospitals, clinics, individual therapists, schools, um, and community members to really make an impact on people's mental well-being, especially during COVID. Yeah. And what is, and then thank you for that. And, and, and I love when you, you touch on that rural aspect. I know that's for Montana, that's really big. And even in, in, a, in a place like Big Sky, it's this time of year, it's lonely, dark, and cold. And yeah. <laughs> you know there's a lot like that. So what does virtual virtual mental health care look like? I mean, like actually, like as a consumer, if I, if I were to, I mean, what is that? How does that feel? What does it look like? How do I interact? Yeah. So, I mean, you're just taking out the, the travel um, and the one-on-one -on -one, like human contact. It's really the same. We're just operating on screens. Um, and Charlie Health specifically, we're you know, working with middle school and high schoolers and then young adults. So they grew up with a phone in their hand. This isn't something new. They're not having to reinvent the wheel on how to access Zoom or login um, or contact um, via you know online platform. So this is actually working in the benefit of them, um, especially because we're treating clients that have a higher acuity diagnosis. Uh, so it feels good to just 
crawl up in your bed after school, after work with a cup of tea, your dog, and just dial in with your clinician and, you know, get it done. Um, and you don't have to worry about a snowstorm or mom and dad can't drive you or your schedule is messed up. Like we're very, we're tailoring uh, our mental health programming to each client and they're able to do it at home. Um, so our, you know, participation and attendance rate is skyrocketing super high. Um, and that's wonderful. That's what we're looking for. We want, we want high engagement and, um, you know, clients from all over the state to support one another on a virtual platform. That's the future. Excellent. That's what we're doing. And we're happy to be doing it in Montana, <laughs> you know, first state. So for some, so, you know, whether it's our media company or someone that's watching tonight that wants to either support or find ways to help accelerate, you know, help, because we're all hearing it. It's in every headline news right now, mental health, mental health. So either if you're someone that needs to reach out for help or you're someone that wants to support this initiative, what type of advice would you get? So the first is if this is an emergency, call 911, um, you know, call our, your ER, get in there and get immediate help. Um, and we'll take it from there. Um, but if it's not an emergency, you can visit us at charliehealth.com. Um, and all of our information is on there. And we're really trying to be a community resource and support everybody who's, you know, wanting to make a difference in the mental health and wellness of Montanans. Um, it's, it takes a village, as they say, and the way the stats are going here, like we really need to be working together to, you know, push this effort forward and collaborate on how to get Montanans well. Excellent, excellent. We'll come back to you in a minute, Laura, for a couple more questions. We're gonna keep sure. around the horn here to keep covering some great topics. I'm going to lob the hot potato over to Joe here and, and let him dive in with the, the other half of our panel. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eric. Um, you know, uh, real quickly, though, I, I did want to ask you, Laura, you know, um, a, a little bit along the lines of what Eric was saying, but, you know, you personally practice yoga and meditation. I was curious, um, just there, you know, briefly, if there are a couple ways that you would um, suggest uh, people dealing with some of some of these complications and difficult times. Yeah, so I'm a huge advocate of incorporating mindfulness techniques into your home, into your daily life. Um, it's really just targeting that central nervous system to just bring yourself down to baseline as much as you can, focusing on your breath, getting outside. We're so lucky to live in this beautiful state. It gets dark at 4.30, but you know, wake up earlier with the birds and go outside, get fresh air, get physical, get into your body, um, start a gratitude journal, call a friend, you know, get, get out there. Um, it really stinks to not be able to have your normal everyday activities, but there are things that you can do to incorporate um, you know, some health and wellness and joy into your life. This is a great time to start a new hobby. I know it sounds like so cliche, but you know, we can't go anywhere after 4.30. Um, it's dark outside, it's freezing for the next 90 days. Like go for it, you know, it, it, it could be exciting. Maybe you have something new inside of you that wants to come out and this is a perfect time to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And then offering support, you know, it's, it's okay to like start a group of your own. You know, get get friends together once a week, play a game, um, start a book club. Um, people are looking for outlets to engage with one another in this time of like deep isolation. Um, so you got to get creative. Um, yeah. And I think something that Charlie Health can do is, you know, we'll throw a blog up on our website on some ideas on what you can do if you're really feeling alone and you don't want to join a group, but you might want to join a book club. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, that's a great answer. And I think it's, um, you know, it's really helpful for people to hear that. I think, I think, you know, there's a lot of, we've heard a lot of some of that, a lot of that stuff, but at the same time, you know, hearing it from you and hearing some of these great ideas um, is helpful. Um, well, I'd love to thank you, Laura. I'd love to jump over um, to a couple of our other panelists, Dr. Eric Lowe, uh, you know, emergency uh, department physician for Bozeman Health, also part of the COVID, uh, involved with the COVID-19 response team. Um, you know, Dr. Lowe, uh, you know, I think from a boots on the ground perspective as a first, as a, as a frontline, you know, worker, 
love to hear you know a little what you're what you're seeing right now, what your day to day is looking like, and how that's changed over the past eight months. Um, thanks for asking. I think um, Gary did a great job of summarizing all the excitement that's coming out in around the vaccines. And mm -hmm. I worked a shift today, and I felt like I came out of that shift, and there was maybe two more vaccines that had been approved with great numbers and all this news to catch up on. Um, but on the other hand, we're also at a point where we're seeing the highest case load that we've dealt with yet. And um, I think if anybody's following the local numbers and you, you look at the graph from starting back in March and we had our, our surge in the spring and then we had another, what we thought was a surge back in July. And then you compare that to the numbers we're seeing now and you can barely even see those little blips on the screen. And, we're now at a point where we're seeing consistently large numbers of cases day to day with a large amount of community spread. Um, the month of November, we've sent, uh, we've been consistently setting records locally in the county and town across the state um, and the broader region of case numbers. And one of the things that, that I think we see is anytime there's a spike in cases, it tends to be seven, 10 days up to two weeks before those cases start needing hospital resources. So each time you see a record number of cases or we see a spike in cases, we can anticipate that our load at the hospital is gonna get bigger a week out, 10 days out. And it's hard to see those consistent numbers knowing a week from now, two weeks from now, things might be worse. And, um, along with that community spread, we've been seeing um, a steady climb, slow, but a steady climb in hospitalizations, the number of mm -hmm. patients requiring the hospital resources. Um, and we've also seen a consistent strain on the, on the resources that we have. Um, I think people who have been following the news have seen that the Bozeman Health um, had to start instituting some contingency staffing measures where our staff was affected to the point where we couldn't maintain the normal 14 day quarantine in some areas and in some areas mm -hmm. have had to use specific precautions and get people back to work before that 14 days. Um, wow. Most of those exposures are happening in the community, not, not at work, thankfully. All of our um, caregivers live in the community here too. And, but that, that high number takes a toll on those resources too. Sure. Yeah. Uh, that's something that's not, when you look at the, the stats that are reported on a regular basis, we put a lot of attention on beds and how many beds are available. But what that doesn't show is are the staff there to staff those beds and which specialists are there and which nursing shifts are covered and which aren't and which cleaning crews and laundry crews and everything else are there to back up those, those beds and that availability. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think I can speak for pretty much everyone here when just saying I know how busy you guys are. And it is, we are in a, a tremendous debt of gratitude, uh, debt of gratitude to, to you all um, for the work you're doing, the hours you're putting in, and you know the, the exposure that, that you guys are taking on every day. Um, you know, what we talk about as we move toward winter, as we move more indoors, we're moving toward uh, cold and flu season. Um, wondering if you have any, uh, any information on, on where flu numbers are right now and uh, if and how they're affecting some of that capacity you were discussing. Um, sure, and thank you for that, that thanks and that gratitude, but I think that that echoes back to the community as a whole because it's, it's the sacrifices of everybody across the community that help protect the resources we have. And it's not, um, it's not one, one group in particular. This is something we're all in together. But um, as to your question for flu, um, I think the numbers were that in October, we ran a little under 200 flu tests and all of those were negative. I'm not aware of us seeing flu cases yet, um, but it definitely has the potential of being out there. Um, and we're definitely encouraging everybody, get your flu shot. This is the year, this is not the year to skip on your flu shot. Um, 
and wait just for a COVID vaccine. Flu shots are just as important this year, even more important this year, because protecting all the resources that we have is key. Um, and any case of flu will only cloud the picture. Right now, there is not just a cold because it's impossible to tell if that just a cold could be COVID or could be um, flu, but more importantly, could it be COVID and all the symptoms overlap? So mm -hmm. this is a year to be incredibly protective for flu, for all respiratory illnesses, um, along with the protections that we're doing for COVID. Yeah, thanks for that, really. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things up in the air right now. Well, uh, Dr. Lowe, we'll be back to you. I'd love to uh, just shift over to Danny uh, Birchwell here for a second. Um, Danny, well, welcome to the show. Thanks again for joining us. Happy to join. Thanks, Joe. So uh, in addition to um, being the executive director for Big Sky Resort Area District, you were recently named to uh, Governor-elect Greg Gianforte's COVID-19 task force, which will you know, be advising Gianforte on recommendations for handling the pandemic in Montana. Uh, you guys have your first meeting tomorrow. What's going through your mind? That's right. Yeah, <clears throat> we, um, we haven't met yet. Tomorrow will be our first meeting. You know, there's looking at the list, which has been expanded. There's now about 30 people that are serving on this yeah. group. Really excited to um, understand what the governor-elect's uh, desires and goals are out of this group and, and really dive in and, and see where I can help to provide some layer of support uh, and bring the perspective of a resort community and a very tourism-based community uh, to the table for the, um, for the task force. You know, I think um, going into the spring, summer season was uh, a big question mark for many of the gateway communities around Yellowstone National Park. And as you all know, my, my background also ties very deeply into those gateway communities as sure. well. So um, hoping to really bring the perspective of a, a tourism driven economy and, and bringing some of the concepts that Big Sky has creatively worked on to the table for the task force to discuss and, and really see how we can help the treasure state and, and keep it healthy and safe in our, um, our economy moving in yeah. a safe. Well, congrats for uh, be, you know, being um, named to that task force. And you know, it's, I can say it's great for uh, us in Big Sky to have a local representative at the table. Um, you know, I was going to, add, you know, that sort of segues right into it. You know, the, you're bringing a perspective of these gateway communities to the state level uh, at a, you know, at a very interesting time. Um, you guys uh, with Big Sky uh, Resort Area District are bringing uh, some, some new testing to the area. Yeah. So, you know, since spring, um, <clears throat> Our organization in the, the district has really been working tirelessly to, to uh, prepare for the impacts that would exist related to COVID-19, which is why we um, really forged the partnership, the uh, very unique partnership with all of the Big Sky Relief Partners, really focused on kind of three different components. There's the response component that the group was really focused on in the spring that was getting our hospital you know, four rooms expanded at the hospital, getting those ventilators purchased for, for our rooms, as well as um, partners working together to, to really get dollars into the, the, um, the hands of those in need. I think there was somewhere around $200,000 uh, that were contributed to 191 individuals and families. Shifting out of that uh, response mode and more into the recovery mode really focused on um, making sure our small businesses were going to be supported, making sure that we had all the opportunities to take advantage of, um, you know, PPE uh, and social distancing guidelines, really getting the messaging out there related to those areas. Uh, somewhere around 465 grants in total were given from the group for local businesses that were um, really questioning how this summer was going to pan out for Big Sky and, and for Southwest Montana at large. We've always had our, our eye on the winter season and, and the unknowns of this whole thing is where we all have 100% alignment and, and wanting to understand what the next step is going to be. But you know our mantra here with the district is better together and I really believe that. And as a community focused on resiliency and looking forward into our winter season, 
when the mountain's receiving, you know, upwards of six to 9,000 skier visits in a, in a day, how are we going to, as a community, be able to support that? And how are we going to be able to prepare to mitigate the impacts of community right. spread within within Big Sky? Um, have to give kudos to the the um, Cross Harbor entities that were doing surveillance testing through the summer season. We all know the uh, the construction site tests certainly highlighted a, a case of uh, community spread amongst a, a work group. You know, the surveillance testing, when you look at the numbers, we're able to completely squash that and, and move it into a more manageable area. And um, we've really been working closely with all of the, the larger employers within the community, as, as well as the health departments, had a, a good conversation today with both Madison and county health departments to launch um, what is going to be announced tomorrow with the formal press release. We're going to be launching the, the Big Sky Surveillance Testing Partnership which is going to bring approximately 450 tests a week to the community at large, um, both community members who are at risk, but those who are just also interested in seeing whether or not they uh, test positive for COVID-19. And, and it really falls on kind of three core areas, the identification of, of positive cases, and then the, um, you know, the isolation and quarantining that takes place with the subsequent identification of a positive COVID case. And this is the big one here is contact tracing. So our plan in partnership with, with Bozeman Health, who is providing symptomatic testing, is to really launch this program for the community on December 7th in a, a very large way. Uh, we're gonna offer up a, a thousand total symptom, asymptomatic tests to the community at large, get a really solid baseline of where we are moving into the winter season and then continue to test uh, through the entire winter season um, with the lab that is going to be here on site in Bozeman with partners who are here on site within our community with Bozeman Health and, and Taylor Rose and his crew over there at Big Sky Medical Center. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I mean, it's, it's huge news. Um, you know, I know one of the July 1st, 2020, uh, there was a surveillance program, uh, testing program going on. One of the issues with that was the turnaround time for tests. And uh, just wondering what that looks like and, and how some of those uh, issues might be mitigated. Yeah, Joe, I think they're still having some challenges related to actually getting the results of a, a test in a timely manner so that the, the contact tracers can really dive in. I'm hearing, well, you all read the same news that I do. So um, we're all fully aware of, of the turnaround time and the challenges that exist with that, particularly on the contact tracers. You know, our, um, our system has built in a lab that is going to actually be supplementing the capacity of the state of Montana. So we're actually bringing this lab in from, from out of state and it'll have two machines that will be in a semi-trailer uh, located here, right here in Big Sky. And the turnaround time is anticipated to be around 24 hours on the turnaround for those results, which is huge on keeping the, the contact tracing load down. Sure, definitely. All right, you know that's that's I'm really glad to hear that, Danny. I know you guys are working hard on on those levels. We'll we'll come back to you, Eric. I was wondering now, you know, if you've got um got something for your other panelists here. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. Um, I first, I had a question for for Dr. Lowe. Um, Doctor, I guess a two-part question for you. One is that for the majority of people that come in that you treat, what, what is the, the advice that you usually send them out the door with in terms of you know, how, to, how to treat themselves or what to do? Because um, obviously the majority of people are, are not being hospitalized. So what, what's usually the advice that you're giving someone after they've come in and, and talked to you guys? And then the second part of the question is now that you start to hear the plans that our community is putting in place and trying to be operational for the winter, I'm going to put you on the spot. What's your reaction to it? Because obviously we're going to be drawing in people from all around the country and to, to come here and enjoy the powder. Um, do, you, do you think the community is getting our, ourselves in shape here to be able to not, not put too much of a burden on your system? Um, the, well, I think the first part of that, what's the advice for the majority of the patients? Um, you know, the majority of people the, the biggest concern is spread. The majority of people 
do okay for in terms of the illness and make it through. Um, the symptoms can still be pretty miserable and it can still be an extended course, but the majority of people are going to do okay. So the majority of the time the instructions are um, ways to support yourself, Tylenol and ibuprofen for symptoms associated with fever, good rest and hydration, um, you know, the things that you've always done for flu and bad colds. Uh, but the big thing that's added on there is the, um, the isolation part and the making sure what do you need to put in place to prevent spreading this to other people. Um, as Danny hit on or, and as that prior discussion hit on, the delays in testing can make it really difficult for doing the contact tracing um, and instructing people that, hey, if you had a test done, you need to treat yourself like you're positive until that test result comes back. Um, and you have a final answer uh, because anything you do while you're waiting for that test, you could inadvertently spread it um, at that time. So the biggest, I think, change for people is that isolation aspect and um, what that means for individuals and their household contacts and their, their close contacts going out from there. As to the second part of your question, um, that's a big question and <laughs> I mean, I applaud the efforts for the testing and everything that everybody has been putting in together to get that up and running and the more testing that we have, the better and especially timely testing with added capacity for tests um, like what was just being described. Um, running more tests on the capacity that we have can easily overwhelm that, but adding more capacity to the system is a great way to go. Um, in terms of the the safety of that in the bigger picture, um, it's it's a tough question, and we are again we are seeing the highest levels of community spread we've had, and we're heading into a holiday, and we know that it spreads with um, travel and around holidays, and um, it, even small gatherings are an easy way to spread it. So I, I do worry about any travel. Um, and how you balance that with the, the economic needs and the realities and the recreational needs and realities of our community and the broader community is not an easy question. Yeah, well, I'll let you, I'll let you stop there because that was a tough one I threw at you, but thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna go over to Gary here and then I'm gonna let Gary had a, a question for Laura. So I'll start with Gary with a question and then I'll let him pivot to being the, 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 he can take it from there to ask a question. But Gary, on this idea of, of coming into the winter on growth on two perspectives. I just would like your your worldly advice or read on this of growth, not only with the area, we've had a tremendous amount of people move here. We are estimating that we grew in terms of real estate sales. We did about five years worth of absorption in the last 10 months. So we've brought a lot of people here, which in turn, then there's gonna be more people enjoying and participating in all the things that are around here. But then as we also open up the ski lifts and start to bring people around from the, the, you know, the country, what's your, you know, kind of your read and your advice as we enter into both that those things being a true reality of w what we're living with? Well, I think, you know, Danny covered really well, I think what the, what the, both Big Sky, YC, Spanish Peaks, I mean, I think the resorts all have a really solid plan. Um, and the, there'll clearly be issues, you know, the shakedown crews of these new testing you know, centers and uh, having a lab on site and things that there will definitely be issues associated with that. Um, but I would think that that'll occur without having the huge numbers here. So that'll, uh, that, that initial testing will be done in early December. And as Danny mentioned, you're offering a thousand people a free test, you start to get a baseline. Um, and as long as you can, I mean, at, at uh, up the hill, when we go up there to stay, you know, we will be tested every seven, 10 days. And so I think that it's just having that be part of what you do. Um, the good news is because people came here in the midst of the pandemic and you were talking about the number of people who came and bought homes, the number of people who are, who are traveling here, I think they have an appreciation that they want it to stay safe. So I actually have found in, in, in a strange way, it also works for some of the small liberal art colleges, the students wanted it to stay safe. So out of all expectation, the students were incredibly well behaved. Reed College, um, Wesleyan, et cetera. You're talking two, six, eight student cases during the, during the fall term. 
And I, so I think it's when people appreciate where they're going and they want it to be a safe place where they can stay, I think you'll see the behavior reflect that. So I actually, I'm actually quite optimistic that uh, we'll, we'll wind up having a, a you know, relatively, you know, given the environment, relatively healthy winter. Great. And then my question for Laura was, so what's getting in your way? So when you, when you guys at Charlie Health, when you look at, is it awareness? of the problems and awareness of the solutions? Is it financial access, financial, just people don't have the wherewithal to subscribe to the services or things? Or are there also administrative issues that, get, that kind of get in your way of providing these services? Uh, that's a big question, Gary. <laughs> um, so I think awareness is, is becoming less of a problem as Charlie Health continues to educate Montanans on, you know, how to strip away the stigma, what to do, who to call, what the continuum of care looks like, proper step downs, proper step ups, how to work together and collaborate with other healthcare partners. I think that's the first thing. I think right now in the current state, it's getting better. But when I first arrived here and started on this mission, it was very segmented. Um, Montanans, you know, they're old school in the way they think. They want to trust. They want to know what is is what is and changing it up um, has been difficult. So part of my job in outreach is really educating on who we are, our place here for Montanans and what we wanna be doing and developing that trust and relationship. I think that that's the first step here. And I think for us to be ultimately successful in driving down those statistics, the community really needs to embrace this change also. I mean, as I said earlier, it takes a village to do anything. Um, the second question is, um, I mean, as far as barriers go um, or just administrative things, um, we're working through that. We definitely want to see some policy changes and some legislative changes um, as far as what we can do and how we can provide as a telehealth provider. Um, and we're working through that. I think, um, you know, with uh, Mr. John Forte being elected and um, his him being a champion of rural health care. I think that a lot of things will change for the better here for Montanans. Um, but I mean, COVID has really just exemplified a ton of wrong things that are happening in our healthcare system in Montana. Um, and I think with all this fresh new blood here, um, I think that it's going to be a really positive thing for change. Um, so we're just going to keep trucking along um, as Charlie Health and getting access to everyone. Um, as far as the financial burdens, um, again, back to COVID, a lot of our commercial payers have COVID waivers in place. So max amount of pockets, um, have been waived for our clients, um, which is amazing. But there's that threat that's hanging over our heads right now that that's going to be taken away at the end of the year. And that's something that we're focused on. You know, are we applying for grants to get funding to help those uh, families that need this access pay, pay for the care? Uh, what does that look like? Where can we get people to help us scholarship kids? Um, and young adults. So we are actively thinking of those barriers and trying to do everything we can to change. But I think uh, this is a, a whole community concept. Um, we need all hands on deck to change. We would love if those COVID waivers stayed in place. Um, how can you give access uh, to mental health care to a kid in Mile City and then take it away because December 31st hits. That doesn't seem right. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to, you know, fix that and get in front of the people. And, you know, we're really focused on our outcomes um, with all of our clients because that's how we can show, you know, the difference that we're making um, from a financial perspective of the payers because that's what they care about. Uh, we care about the client perspective and them getting well. So we have to find somewhere in the middle um, to make that difference and that we're doing it all. Um, so we're just happy to be here and supporting Montanans and everybody in Big Sky um, and just get the state well. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Yeah, Thank you. Sure. Yep. 
So we're going to go around the horn, ask everybody one last question, and then we'll uh, wrap this baby up. I'm going to start with Gary. Gary, this question, I got a lot of feedback from the community that re people really appreciated. Last time you asked, I asked you this, so I'm going to ask again, but um, is your, adv your, your advice for, for business owners? Um, you know, I mean, back nine months ago, I think the thing that I remember you saying was to batten down the hatches and and we did it and we really you know studied our balance sheet and made sure that we were smart about our money but you know coming into this winter you know we got a lot of subsidy money that was out of nowhere that was a big surprise for a lot of us and helped get us through the summer but what advice would you give especially small business owners entering this winter and into next year um okay so i would say at this point i would say believe in technology I actually think that the vaccines that are coming out will be robust enough and it'll be a question of distribution and timing. I think that the technologies like Zoom, the delivery, the door, and pick, pick any one of the things that are helping small businesses survive the last six to nine months, all of the reasons you're doing that are not gonna go away. People are not gonna suddenly just flip a switch and go back. Restaurants aren't gonna be able to recover quite the same way. So. So trust that what you've put in place, or if you haven't, you should be looking at what you can put in place to take advantage of the technology platforms that exist today. I think the vaccine will get us six months from now, when you're looking at summer and big sky, I think it will be dramatically lower risk. You're going to have a ramp up phase now that Danny and the Danny and lots of people are working on, and I think they'll wind up being successful. But there's still going to be 60 to 90 days, which puts you right smack in the middle of ski season. It's going to put you in the uh, you know end of February, so you're not going to get a, a free pass on that. So I think you need to be caught, you know, conscious in managing your business. But you should know enough in terms of how people are going to work from home, how people are going to be working out. Trust the fact, tr invest in the technology, and invest in the fact that that's probably the way things are going to stay. The the idea of going back to normal, there is no more normal. Things don't go back to the way they were, and I think that we should you you should make sure you're on the right side of that. Excellent. And, and Gary, just slight follow up to that. I mean, because we are not in the, you know, you have the good fortune of looking into it and working with a lot of bigger cities, bigger metropolitan areas that you're hearing about this unraveling of people moving either permanently or they're shutting down these big buildings. You know, you heard a stat today, one in six restaurants will not reopen. Um, you know, I mean, what, what kind of sticky impact is that going to have? And that's going to all trickle down to a Bozeman or to a big sky market. But, you know, what does that look like in a couple months and, and, and the, the ramifications of some of those big fundamental shifts that are happening in the big cities like New York or Seattle? Well, I think that, oh, it's, it's nice to hear you used to have New York, New York and Seattle in the same, in the same uh, breath there, Eric. I, I appreciate that. But, you know, fundamentally, these cities have a real problem. And the more concentrated their workforce was, the bigger the problem. So in Seattle, downtown Seattle, you have Amazon. And Amazon dwarfed everyone else, 40 something thousand, 50,000 workers. And so the repercussion of, of Amazon saying to their senior executives, you, can, you don't have to come into the office, except once every occasion. All the surrounding businesses, the satellite businesses that support that activity are in real trouble. And so if you're looking at the, and the investment banking business in New York, really, I don't think you need 30 people in every meeting to approve a deal. So there's just fundamentally some things, again, that, have, that are going to be this hollowing out effect. Now, the good news for Montana, the people that are hollowing, that are leaving, are all the white collar professional class, the working class from that perspective, they are great people to go to Montana because they're knowledge workers and you can work from home and you can work remotely. And so with what Governor Jen Forte, Governor elect, sorry, Jen Forte is planning on doing the focus on broadband, the focus on bringing these people back to Montana or bringing this, it's the right group of people to come because it's very sustainable. So at the higher level, Montana is a beneficiary, but I would not be investing in commercial real estate in downtown in the major metropolitan areas right now. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> I, will not, I will not do that. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Joe, why don't you hit the last couple of questions and then we'll wrap this baby up. Yeah, that sounds good. Thanks, Eric. And, and thank you, Gary. Uh, Danny, I wanted to come back to you here. So, um, you know, Big Sky School District is looking to potentially go back uh, full time. Um, I was curious if the district has been in touch with you and your team uh, regarding 
uh, the surveillance testing that you guys are rolling out in December? Oh yeah, the surveillance testing is community-wide. So it's really taken into consideration all of the needs of the employers throughout the community. I wanna say the, the 65% is the participation rate that they were hoping to get in order to trigger that going back to, to school full-time um, situation. But um, you know, they got kind of a jump start on this thing through a, a generous donation from one of the local foundations with some of those mail-in kits. So they've thankfully worked out some of the kinks related to how this thing is gonna work. Um, but we've definitely been in, in close contact with Dr. Shipman and, and the school. Got it, got it. Um, you know, last thing I was going to uh, touch base with, with was with you, Dr. Lowe. Uh, you know, um, a lot of there's a lot of myth and there's a lot of reality out there, and I think that line is blurred in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, what what are some kind of coronavirus, COVID nineteen myths uh, versus reality that that you've heard recently that you'd think people would be, would be important for them to hear? Um, one that uh, I think I touched on a little bit earlier is the statement of, oh, I don't have COVID, I just have a cold. Um, I think that's one to watch out for very carefully. There isn't a way to tell just based on the symptoms. So if you find yourself saying, oh, I just have a cold, um, I can still go to work or I can still go mingle with people, but you need to be really careful of that one. Um, I think testing is another one that there's a lot of, a lot of confusion and comp complexity around that, that leads to a lot of confusion and um, understanding that uh, a negative test is a negative test on the day that the test was done. Um, it's not immunity for, for a week to go do whatever you want, but it, um, the more testing we have, the better by far. Um, but also knowing the limits that, Hey, if I tested negative with a test that was done yesterday, but I have symptoms today, that's a new story and a new situation and, um, making sure that, um, rec you recognize that. Um, and then I think it was talked about earlier, just, to, um, there's so much change in the information with this. This is a new disease that we've figured out on the fly throughout the year. So I think recognizing that there is that confusion and that's okay. And just that we need to consistently um, reevaluate the information that's out there, be open to new information, learn as we go, listen to the experts and um, expect that things may change. And that's the way science and new knowledge works, especially when we're dealing with something that we're all learning on the fly like this. Sure, absolutely. Well, much appreciated. Thanks for that answer. Again, thanks for what uh, you guys and your team at Bozeman Health and the Big Sky Medical Center, um, all frontline employees, nurses, doctors. It's, it's uh, so crucial what everybody's doing. So thank you again. Um, well, I appreci we appreciate everyone's time. We have one final question. We're gonna uh, go through everyone. Um, and you know, since we're here, Dr. Lowe with you, we'll just stick on you. Um, you know, what are you doing to make Thanksgiving uh, special with friends and family? And what are you grateful for this year? Oh, um, I'll start with the, what am I grateful for? And um, I think I'm grateful for the support of the whole community and the, um, all the sacrifices that everyone across the board has made um, to try and get our community to that finish line of those vaccines that we keep talking about. The, the news is very optimistic and it's great. We're not to that finish line, but maybe it's starting to appear in the, the, in the horizon out there. And um, I think I'm very thankful for the, the sacrifices that everyone is making to get us there. Um, as far as what are we doing to make Thanksgiving special? It's gonna be a small one. It's just gonna be with the household here and my immediate family and uh, we're going to see what we can create for some new traditions this year. Sure thing. It's going to be interesting Lowe. what the kids cook. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> a lot of Play-Doh in the microwave. Um, <laughs> Dr. Lowe, thank you again for your time. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And every, again, what you're all and your colleagues are doing. Thank uh, you. Move, all. Yeah. Let's move over to, to Laura. Um, Laura, what are you, what are you going to do to make this Thanksgiving special for you and your family and, and friends, and uh, and what are you grateful for? 
Sure. Um, so my family spread out all over the country, Montana, Pennsylvania, Alaska, um, and we get together, you know, every year, but this year we're being responsible and we're staying separated. Um, on Wednesday night, we're going to all log into Zoom and make pies together um, as an activity nice. just for a little bit of a group. Um, and then on Thanksgiving, I'll just be with my partner here and keep it really small and isolated, but still yummy. Um, and I'm like super thankful to be on this panel, but also just the amount of support um, and positivity and encouragement that I've um, gotten from Montanans about just changing what the mental health platforms look like in Montana and just being part of the change, you know, mm -hmm. be the change you want to see. It's really cool to be acting it out. So I'm very thankful for that. Absolutely. Well, Laura, thank you and your team as well. Welcome. I mean, it is such an important component of what we're seeing and it will continue to be so for, for, for sure. Time. So thanks so much. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah you too. Sure. Um, Mr. Birchwell, Danny, what are you uh, doing this Thanksgiving with uh, to make, make it special for friends and family? And, and what are you grateful for this year? Yeah, good, good question, Joe. Um, I'd also be curious to hear what your answer is and Eric's. <laughs> but um, Thanksgiving, we have this thing that we call Friendsgiving and it's turned into a little tradition where, you know, I think for the past 10 years, a, a good group of us uh, from throughout the state have, have gotten together and, and celebrated and um, thanks together. And uh, I think we'll try to do that with a, a virtual toast on the old Zoom. So uh, excited about that. Um, what am I grateful for? Um, you know, I would say, so Big Sky Resort, Lone, Lone Peak, Lone Mountain has some of the biggest skiing in America. I think this community has some of the biggest hearts in, in reality. And, and the fact that we've all been able to band together the way that we have is something that we all should be grateful for uh, in Southwest Montana. And, you know, I would um, encourage all of us, let's exercise extra kindness as we um, move forward in the next six months. Let's exercise extra grace, patience with each other this is stressful for everyone. And it's, it's a challenge for everyone. And I, I think we all fundamentally are experiencing the same challenge, whether you call it COVID fatigue or any other um, word that is out there. Let's not forget to support each other. We're all human beings and we all live in a wonderful place that we get to call home uh, here in Montana. And let's make sure that, uh, that we continue to do that to, together, but graciously together as we go into this winter season. Got it. Uh, that's a great answer, Danny. Thanks so much. And I'll be raising a glass to you on Thanksgiving and uh, to you and your Zoom um, folks. Um, thanks again for what you're doing, for bringing um, you know, this testing capability to, to the community. I think it has an incredible, uh, there's an incredible opportunity there. So appreciate what you and your uh, team are doing there. And, uh, oh, just real quick on, on that topic, um, more information will be available on Big Sky Relief because people are going to want to know how do you pick up the tests, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. So we're still working out the, the details on that. Tonight, we got kind of an under the hood type of look for, for what we're, we're headed into here with the testing regime. Um, more details to come and um, a press release will be coming out tomorrow. So Yeah, and we'll be reporting on that tomorrow as well. So folks keep tuned in to um, Big Sky Resort Area District and EBS. Uh, we'll get you the information you need to know. Thanks, Danny, appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Uh, Gary Reichel. Love to uh, come to you with this question. Um, you know, what are you doing uh, to make Thanksgiving special with family and friends this year? And, and what are you grateful for? You know, Danny should get the last word. <laughs> there is absolutely nothing could be said that's more gracious than what he said. So I'm going to leave it with that. <laughs> absolutely. You got it. Well, I guess finally, thanks again, Gary. Appreciate uh, you coming on and joining us again on the, on the Big Sky Town Hall. Um, I'd love to ask my publisher, Eric Ladd, this question, you know, what are you doing to make Thanksgiving special this year? And, and what are you grateful for this Thanksgiving? Well, because we get to be considered in the COVID family, I hope I'm drinking a beer with you, Joe, because we're with each other every day. So I think that <laughs> is, but um, what I'm grateful for this year, and I think Danny really hit it home. And I'm really, I really, it really hit, it, it hit at the heartstrings with Danny said, but yesterday I was out walking on this ranch on the Ruby River that is under easement from Montana Land Reliance. 
And what I'm really grateful for is all the groups that are working so hard to protect Montana because we're going to get through COVID. We're going to get through all these ups and downs as a community and stuff. But the one thing that is going to constantly gain, get, gain pressure as more and more people come to Montana is, is this beautiful nature and this beautiful place that we get to call home and to see these beautiful sunsets and the open fields and the mountains and the clear water. And I'm so grateful for, you know, groups like the Nature Conservancy and Montana Land Reliance and Gallatin River Task Force and Gallatin Valley Land Trust. That work is so important and let's not forget it because when we look up and we get past all this, which we will, all of us are here for a reason and that's because what we look out and get to see. And so when I was walking on that ranch yesterday, man, I was grateful. I was glad it was under easement. It'll never be developed. It'll never change. And I was just so grateful that someone was smart enough to do that. And I'm grateful for all those groups, hard work and the work that they're doing. So that's what I'm grateful for. And Joe, I'm going to put it on you to have the last word and tell us what you're grateful for. And, and we'll send this thing home. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Eric. Thanks to the, all our panelists. We really appreciate your time. Um, it's valuable information that we can get to the community and, Part of what I'm grateful for is just being able to speak with, you know, experts and, and folks such as yourselves that can inform the community in real time and, and let us know, um, you know, what's really going on out there. You know, we were, Eric, we were going to go to, Emily and I were going to go to Tahoe and see our friends for this Friendsgiving thing. We held on as long as we could and we held a Zoom meeting and one of them's a, a nurse, one of them is a kindergarten teacher and you can see exactly where that went. So. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to hold off on the Tahoe trip, but we'll be there soon, guys. Um, we're gonna do a local thing here. We're gonna uh, have some Zoom calls with my family, a big family, and that's really what I'm I'm grateful for as well as uh, you know my family, Emily, uh, my wife, and uh, my folks um, who are in the in Virginia, and my brothers and sisters who are all over the country. Uh, we miss you guys and. Uh, but we're gonna all gonna figure out how to have a happy Thanksgiving and I'll try not to burn the turkey again. But thank you guys very much. Um, appreciate everyone in the audience. Thanks for your time and uh, tune in next time. We'll see you later. It's been Eric Ladd, uh, publisher of EBS and myself, Joe O'Connor, uh, editor in chief. And um, happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon.